Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Shut In, Shut Out, Shut Up, Season 4, Intersectionality. It's good to have you with us. I'm Fiona Macmillan. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a disability advocate, practitioner, speaker and writer. I chair the Disability Advisory Group at St Martin in the Fields and I'm a trustee of Inclusive Church. Since 2012, I've been helping to shape the annual Living Edge Conference on Disability and Theology, a partnership between St Martin in the Fields and Inclusive Church. It's a space for disabled and neurodivergent people to gather to resource each other and the church. These heart edge conversations grew out of the annual conference, shaped by disabled people's experience over the pandemic. Experience of being shut in, increasingly isolated and restricted in our daily lives. Shut out from society and church as new ways of doing things overlook access and those whose health is more vulnerable feel set aside. And shut up, our voices and experience often excluded from conversations. In these seminar series, now in our third year, we hold space for disabled people to explore issues and ideas in the context of faith, theology, church culture and practice. As usual, I'll begin with some housekeeping, then introduce the subject and our speakers, Kate Harford and Rachel Noel. If you'd like to, please do introduce yourselves in the chat. Perhaps say who you are and where you're joining from. Let's begin with some housekeeping access. Our BSL interpreter today is Emma. If you're using BSL, you can pin Emma's screen and the speakers. For automatic captions, you click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen and they should display. If you're using a screen reader and don't want to be disturbed by the chat, let us know and we'll save the chat for you to email afterwards. If you need any help with anything during this session or if you see anything that concerns you, please drop a note in the chat or direct message our Heart Edge hosts. Jonathan Evans or Catherine Juice. Timings. The first half of our session will be input as we hear from today's speakers. The second half will be a chance for you to share resources, experience, responses, experience and ideas. Around 5.15 we'll spend about 10 minutes in small groups, then come back together for plenary discussion and questions. We'll end with some last thoughts, resources and signposting to future events. The first half will be recorded in speaker view, but do turn your camera off if you prefer. Please keep your microphone on mute throughout unless you've been invited to speak. This helps with the quality of the recording and works for those who are sound sensitive, including me. I've got Tourette's and some sounds, especially unexpected ones, set off physical or verbal tics. These are involuntary movements, sounds and words, including swear words. I usually hold them in, but it's not always possible. And it's important that I come as I am, because that's what we're here for, to be perfectly and wonderfully ourselves. We hope you'll be comfortable to come exactly as you are too. Over these six sessions of this series, we're exploring the intersections of disability and neurodiversity with gender, mental health, sexuality, race, and poverty, and talking about key issues in the context of theology and faith, culture and practice of the church. We began by defining our terms and explored the intersection of disability and neurodiversity with Anne Mehmet who spoke of the pain of having parts of our identities rejected and the importance of church as a space for belonging. Last week, we considered disability, neurodiversity and gender with Molly Boot and Alex Claire Young. You can catch up with these conversations on the Heart Edge Facebook page and YouTube channel, along with our earlier seasons. So I'm going to introduce today's subject and then I'll hand over to Kate and Rachel 
to explore the intersectional experience of disability, neurodiversity and mental health. And that was a spasm. They come and go. Mental health refers to cognitive, behavioural and emotional well-being. It's about how people think, feel and behave. People sometimes use the term mental health to mean the absence of a mental disorder. But mental health affects daily living, relationships and physical health. Some people call mental health emotional health or well-being. And it's just as important as good physical health. We all have times when we feel down or stressed or frightened. Most of the time these feelings pass, but sometimes they develop into a more serious problem and that can happen to any one of us. Everyone is different and our mental health doesn't always stay the same. It can change as circumstances change and as we move through different stages of our life. There is a stigma attached to mental health problems. This means people feel uncomfortable talking about them and don't talk about them much. Many people don't even feel comfortable talking about their feelings, but it's healthy to know and say how we're feeling. Mental health problems are very common. Just this week, one in six people will have experienced a common health, mental health problem. Anxiety and depression are the most common, with around one in 10 people affected at any one time. Anxiety and depression can be severe and long lasting and have a big impact on people's ability to get on with life. Between one and two people in every hundred experience a severe mental illness, such as bipolar or schizophrenia, and have periods when they lose touch with reality. People may hear voices, see things no one else sees, hold unusual beliefs, feel unrealistically powerful, or read specific particular meanings into everyday events. Although certain symptoms are common in specific mental health problems, no two people behave in exactly the same way when they are unwell. Many people who live with a mental health problem or are developing one try to keep their feelings hidden because they're afraid of other people's reactions. And many people feel troubled without having a diagnosed or diagnosable mental health issue, although that doesn't mean that they aren't struggling to cope with daily life. Physical health problems significantly increase the risk of poor mental health and vice versa. 30% of people in the UK live with a long-term physical health condition. Around 30% of those people also have a mental health problem, most commonly depression or anxiety. 20% of people in the UK live with mental health problems and around 45% of them also have a physical long-term condition. Mental health problems can seriously exacerbate physical illness, affecting outcomes and treatment. Autistic people are also more likely to have anxiety and depression than non-autistic people of all genders. Autistic women and non-binary people experience mental health issues at higher rates than men and at similar rates to each other and autistic people are twice as likely as non-autistic people to have eating disorders. It's really important that churches and communities understand these intersections of mental health and consider these issues in the context of faith, theology, church culture and practice. I'm delighted to introduce today's guest speakers, Kate Tarford, and Rachel Noel, who will be helping us to do this. Before I do, I'd just like to draw your attention to the mind information, which we're dropping into the chat regularly during this session. We recognize that discussing mental health issues can be very difficult and triggering for some people. And we ask that you do protect yourselves, take good care 
if you need help, please do reach out for it. And so to Kate and Rachel. Kate Harford is a priest in the Metropolitan Community Churches, University Chaplain and Pastoral Care Lead at Oxford Brooks University. Based on her lived experience, Kate has a particular interest in queer theology and the faith experiences and expressions of neurodivergent people and those who live with mental illness. Kate lives with her wife and cat in Oxford and enjoys knitting, playing the flute and disrupting the cis heteropatriarchal systems. Kate Rachel Noel is known locally as the Pink Vicar. She's priest in charge of St Mark's Church Pennington, a heart-edged church in the Diocese of Winchester. Creative, colourful, enthusiastic, autistic, ADHD, bipolar and vulnerable to COVID, Rachel is passionate about diversity and inclusion. She is a member of the community of Hope Weavers. Um, Rachel and Kate, we are delighted to have you with us today and look forward to hearing from you both. Welcome. Um, let's begin by hearing about your experience and ideas. Kate, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you. It's a genuine delight having uh, viewed some of these sessions on YouTube in advance and benefited from the work of many people who are here. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here and thank you Fiona particularly for your patience in helping me prepare. When I accepted the invitation to come and talk today I decided to use my platform to talk about the lack of awareness and understanding around self-harm in the context of church, mental health and neurodiversity. It seems appropriate to start by acknowledging the implications of that. I will talk about things that are difficult and some of it will be very personal. Please take care of yourself. I won't be offended if you mute your audio or step away whilst I'm speaking. I will be careful not to share about methods, but it is likely to still be difficult. You can, of course, watch the session back later if you feel you need to leave the recordings and come back for the discussion. Um, if I find it difficult, please also bear with me. Although I've talked about this over a number of years, it's fairly infrequent and it can still be hard. My primary ministry is higher education chaplaincy, offering spiritual and pastoral care to staff and students of any faith or none at a university. As part of the mental health and wellbeing services, I talk regularly with students and staff who are facing difficulties with their own mental health. For a number of reasons, the number of people that we see presenting with mental health difficulties, particularly diagnosable and complex mental health difficulties is increasing. And we see that many people are struggling to access appropriate care and treatment, not because of anything that universities do, but because of cuts to NHS mental health services. I'm particularly concerned that a lack of timely intervention, especially with very young adults, can increase risk in later life. I'm also licensed as a minister in the Metropolitan Community Churches, um, MCC. We're a queer-centric Trinitarian denomination that has several churches in the UK. Um, as well as being a chaplain, I work with the denominational vocations coordinator to support our people discerning a call to ministry or working in vocational ministry. I'm relatively new in that role, but I hope that I bring to it an understanding of inclusive practice and how to apply that to professional development and training. Inclusive practice is an educational principle that recognises the difference between students, that all students may have differences and needs, and works to ensure that everybody can access educational content and participate fully in their learning. It understands that no two learners are the same and ensures that process and policy and requirements accommodate this. It's my view that this is preferable to placing the burden on clergy and ordinands to constantly request adjustments and have external individuals decide whether their requests are reasonable or not. Sorry, I just did air quotes around the word reasonable. 
there is an, a power imbalance implied in having to constantly request adjustments to your training. So bringing my own understanding and experiences of disability, I hope that that is something that I can harness for good. I'm a neurodivergent person. I've expected that I might be for some time, had it confirmed about six years ago at the age of 35 that I have ADHD and possibly some autistic traits, but I'm not, I'm not intending to seek that through a diagnostic pathway. Part of my experience is that I also have a diagnosis of emotionally unstable or borderline personality disorder. My GP insists emotionally unstable is less stigmatizing. I honestly don't care. Given the overlap in diagnostic criteria for those two conditions, ADHD and emotionally unstable personality disorder, my sense of my experience is that the trauma of navigating a world built for neurotypical people as someone with an undiagnosed neurodivergence is likely to be a contributing factor, not only in my own personality disorder experience, but probably in many others as well. Um, emotionally unstable personality disorder is particularly diagnosed in women who are less likely to have a diagnosed neurodivergence than their male counterparts. I can say more about that later in wider discussion, but it isn't part of my main focus. In addition to all of that, I'm studying for an MA at Queen's by distance learning, and hoping to spend some of my time exploring the theology and church experience of people who have self-harmed. Because most of the literature that's available, and I'm afraid there's not much, is written without a lived experience perspective. From my own experience, I'm hoping that by talking to other people about what they have lived through, we can start to change the narrative from one of dismissal or pity or condescension into something else. I expect to receive insight and honesty and hope, but I also know that it's important to be honest and have integrity in reporting what I'm given, even if it's not what I expect or want. To close out my first, uh, first bit of speaking, to close out my introduction, I've heard many times that those of us who are ministers and preachers should speak from our scars and not our wounds. But I was also challenged recently particularly by younger adults, with the idea that this could be ableist, because it relies on the idea that the voice of someone who is in distress is less valuable than the voice of someone who is seen as being in recovery and who may themselves be masking severe distress. I've reflected on both of those ideas and come to the conclusion that there isn't a clear dichotomy between scars and wounds. Those of us who work in any form of ministry, lay, ordained, paid or unpaid, must be careful to use our experience appropriately to build up the community and the love of God. That doesn't mean being silent or wearing a mask of a false positive. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for a great introduction. It's wonderful to have you with us. Um, Rachel, perhaps you could tell us something of your experience and ideas. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Kate. Oh, what an amazing conversation, people, this afternoon. I'm Rachel Noel, an Anglican priest, and I lead a church here in Pennington in the New Forest. Um, as a vicar, wife and mum, I speak to lots of people about all sorts of things and find that many people are quite open about their physical scars or their wounds. But when it comes to mental health, it's quite a different story. People don't share as freely. And I've learned why, I can see why. I found that when I talk about my past psychosis and manic episode, some people treat me differently. In 2016, when I was a curate, I was signed off work with anxiety and depression. I had an atypical reaction to the medication, mania and psychosis, but I didn't know that's what it was until later. In the mania, I went Googling and I found out about ADHD. One of the gifts of ADHD is hyperfocus. Hyperfocus within mania is something special. On day eight of mania, I wrote for 14 hours straight through the night, 30,000 words, a sense of deep peace. I call it right night. ADHD and me, at that moment, the label seemed almost irrelevant. It was the insight, the understanding, the compassion for the first time ever I felt an inkling of really knowing who I am 
a sense of belonging in my mind and body. And the next night, day nine of mania, I took this into prayer and meditation. And I had such a deep sense of encounter within the divine of peace and light, accepting the connections, the body, the person that I am connected within all creation, being present here now, deep joy, peace, radiant light, present to God's presence. I call this light night. On day 10 of mania, I went to curate's training in the diocesan offices. Possibly wasn't one of the better choices I've ever made in life. After shouting at one bishop in the diocesan office, I was taken to A&E by another bishop and I was sectioned. In the wake of psychiatric hospital, I was diagnosed with bipolar. And that same week I had my ADHD assessment and was also diagnosed with ADHD and autistic traits. And that was later confirmed as autism too. Coming out of hospital, I encountered people's fear. Whilst the conversation about mental health has opened up a lot in recent years, mostly that is around depression and anxiety. For those of us that have the privilege of more unusual experiences, mania, psychosis, hearing voices, experiencing the world so differently to those around you, there is still so much fear. I found clergy wanted to pray for demons to be released. People wanted to pray for my healing. People telling me that in eternal life, there would be me without any of these labels, without that, these experiences, that somehow these aspects of me, both the deep lifelong gift of having a brain that thinks differently and having a body that processes sensory experiences different, differently, for many, somehow these aspects of me were lesser, were wrong. For some, they were seen as scary and as dangerous. My curacy was extended, both for me to recover from what had happened, but also whilst the institution worked out if they were willing to sign me off, if it was possible to be a priest with any, let alone all of my diagnoses. Even once I had been signed off and appointed to my current role where I am now in Pennington, there are still those that question my vocation, that are fearful of my diagnoses. There is stigma and discrimination. For me, both mental health and neurodivergent diagnoses came through at the same time, and these have sometimes been conflated by others. Autistic me seeks clarity, seeks structure, sees processes and I have an acute sense of fairness, honesty and integrity and those are hard boundaries for me. My ways of communication don't always match others and because I have mental health diagnoses often it seems easier for others to choose to silence me to discount my voice based on misperceptions of my mental health. I'm fortunate I'm white, middle class, employed currently, professional, I've only had one episode of mania and bias and psychosis, and yet I have still experienced stigma, discrimination, bias, and silencing. One of the reasons that I speak so openly about my experiences is because of the privilege I have and the support I have of friends and family. Public Health England states that psychosis is one of the most life and impacting conditions in healthcare. 6% of the UK population say they have experienced at least one symptom of psychosis. Those diagnosed with severe mental illness such as psychosis die on average 15 to 20 years earlier than the general population. It is such an isolating condition and I experienced just bits of that isolation. And more recently in pandemic, people with psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia are five times more likely to die from COVID-19. There shouldn't be any connection between psychosis and death from COVID-19. And people with psychotic disorders are three times more likely to be hospitalized, according to research by University of Manchester Health Data Scientists at the end of last year. This stuff that we're talking about today, this really matters. It's not just fluffy optional extra stuff about caring for people. This is matters of life and death. It's the end of my start. Thank you, Rachel. Um, 
this is a very powerful conversation we're having today and it's not a conversation which is had very often so i would just remind people to please do take care of yourselves please feel free to share in the chat and in the groups later on and there'll be time to share in the plenary later where it's not recorded um, but please do take care of yourselves as we dive into these very powerful and difficult conversations about people's difficult challenging painful experience in the church thank you both for your honesty and willingness to come and speak truth to power so kate let's begin with a bit of speaking truth to power what are some of the key issues in this intersection in the context of faith thank you so again, in case anyone's arrived late, I will be speaking again in broad terms about self-harm. I'll talk about prevalence. I'll talk about its position in church and theology. I'll talk about stigma and negative responses and will reference disordered eating. I won't share methods and may mention the experience of living with physical scarring. Self-harm is increasing. Um, a recent study, I think it was 2017, suggested a lifetime incidence of 6.4% in adults from 18 to 70. That means in a church of 100 adults, between six and seven have at least one experience of self-harm. In my local Anglican diocese, there are 400 clergy. If they are representative of the general population, and if is doing some heavy lifting in that sentence, that would mean that 24 would have lived experience of self-harm. I don't think many of us have ever heard a Christian minister disclose that in a church or church gathering setting. It seems therefore that we struggle with a dual difficulty in care received by Christians and other religious people living with self-harm as a coping mechanism. Because whilst the church is publicly sidelined, the church is also sidelined in health uh, sorry, publicly silent, the church is also sidelined in health and social care. Recent draft NICE guidelines say that, quote, self-harm is everyone's business, but the documents attached to the guidelines have no references to research or resources on religious and spiritual care. So religious people are invisible in mental health care and policy, and self-harm is invisible in churches. This perpetuates a cycle in which it's hard for ministers to learn good pastoral practice because the education and resources simply aren't available. That creates bad theology and bad theology creates real life harm. I started attending church for myself when I was about 16. For all the good it did for my life, and there has been good, church was also the first place where someone validated the shame I felt both about my mental health and my sexuality, often in the same breath. <laughs> Amongst the things I heard from people in a position of responsibility in the church were, quote, you won't be able to get married because of the scars on your arms. You can't wear a wedding dress. Um, depression is pride in how bad you are, and that makes it sinful. And the ever popular reduction of high rates of mental, health, mental illness in the LGBTQIA plus community to our so-called bad relationships with God, rather than take the risk to acknowledge the connection between the shame and the trauma of oppression and the development of mental illness. I was given verses out of context to try and force me into being cheerful or to invalidate extreme negative emotional states. I was encouraged to see healing as a black and white experience. One was either unwell or healed, and therefore as the right of any Christian who prayed correctly. That gave me an extremely difficult relationship with God because the God I was praying to was definitely not in the business of clicking their fingers and making me better. And I struggled to relate to the Gospels because the healing and miracle narratives felt to be just another testament of how faithless I was being. So I moved away from that church tradition when I went to university and moved to a church that took a queer affirming stance where I still serve today. Mental health was discussed openly and it was OK to ask questions but I've still experienced a very mixed response from my peers 
both in the pews and in the lectern and pulpits. There we are. <laughs> During my training, I attended a church conference in Chicago in July. If you've ever been to Chicago in July, you will know it is extremely warm. My clergy training mentor took me aside to tell me off for dressing comfortably in a short sleeved shirt because the well healed but visible marks of injuries were inappropriate in clergy in front of members of the church. That was the same conference where a sermon was preached that said that people who were not healed of their disabilities were internalizing them as their life stories. Um, and the preacher was very defensive when that narrative was challenged by a disabled member of the conference. A month later, on the other extreme, the pastor who was working with me locally in my training stood up at a festival in a session discussing mental health and without having told me they would do this, disclosed that there was someone in their church who celebrated the Eucharist openly displaying self-harm scars. This was presented as a good thing, but to me, these two reactions, you must not and you must, have something in common. They both treat me as an object and a symbol and reduce my ministry to something that is a story. On the one hand, one must be distant, unrelatable, above human concerns and immune to psychological distress. On the other, one must be constantly present, constantly vulnerable and constantly modelling our distress. Neither of these people saw me as a full person because they didn't have a good and full understanding of mental health in general or self-harm in particular. And they didn't trust me to tell my story on my own terms, in my own way, and differently on different occasions if I so chose. By trying to control the narrative, my experience was twisted into their framework. And I think this is common from when people beyond a community try to tell that community's stories. We see it in women's stories told by men. We see it in black people's stories told by white people. They always serve the storyteller and the storyteller serves the institution. And there were good moments. There were healing moments. A pastor who tried to help by telling me I obviously wasn't the only person he'd ever encountered who'd self-harmed when I was 19. It was clumsy, but it effectively countered the narrative of shame and the idea that I was the only Christian who couldn't get through this. Because of that, he was someone I came to trust quite quickly. And at the other end of that journey, at the end of my training, my final training mentor before ordination, um, I started a summer placement the summer after I'd been in Chicago. And it, even in Newcastle, it can be too warm to wear long sleeve shirts all the time. I tentatively explained that I was a bit warm, but I was worried about how the congregation and particularly the children's church would react. And she simply said, we're a family and this is your story and your body. When we discussed it later, she disclosed that she didn't feel that she was totally in control of the moment, but because she reached for truth and compassion, I didn't see that. I didn't care in that moment that she was or wasn't an expert. I cared that I was heard and I felt like I was heard. The experiences that I've had in my mind and in my body mean that I very rarely feel fully healthy and fully well, but I am still able to have a meaningful relationship with God. Along with accepting my queer self, coming to terms with the idea that I might be someone who is inherently instable and uncertain has probably played an important part in underpinning my understanding of God, in whose image in some way I was made. I have a different understanding of what it means to lean not on your own understanding than those who may feel healthier in their minds. I have first-hand experience of knowing not to trust what my brain is telling me. I find it easy to identify with despair and desperation of people seeking healing from Jesus, but hard to see, it, see myself in the straightforwardly faithful who don't stumble. We have a lot to offer the church. Wow, thank you, Kate. Um, I'm not going to interrupt. I'm going to hand straight over to Rachel to ask Rachel 
what for you are the key issues in the context of faith? I think some of what I say might echo a little bit of what Kate said. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think there are some really key issues and I think these are often a very particular ideas of how our church leaders should be, what their stories should be and what stories should be told in our churches. And I think underneath these, there are desires for perfection. Um, one of the dominant narratives around our faith is one of creation and fall. And in that, questions of purity seem to have seeped in very strongly. And of Jesus then being seen as a ticket to transformation, a once off magic wand that removes life's challenges. And Christian testimonies that are spoken in our churches are often around this sort of formula. I had a messy life, difficult things happened, I found Jesus, I came to faith, and now things are okay. I'm sure we've all heard variations of that story. And in this way of telling a story, a Christian story, different ways of being don't often fit, and they're not often heard. I want to tell you a short version of my story. I found Jesus, I came to faith, and sometimes I have depression and I have anxiety. I've experienced psychosis, I hear voices, and sometimes I encounter the depths of God's peace within those experiences. That's not the way Christian stories are usually told. There's often a deep fear within our churches about this sort of experience. And when it happened to me, it surprised me that in my experience, psychiatrists were more open to a conversation about faith and spiritual encounter within mental health, whereas clergy were far more fearful of the same discussion. Sam Wells, in his book Improvisation, talks about a deep-seated fear of the unconscious in Christian circles. I have to say Sam is writing about improvisation as a model for Christian ethics and not about mental health and diversity, but I am going to quote from him because I think it's relevant here. For the improviser, the unconscious is not to be feared as a dark realm of dangerous instinct and forbidden desire. It is instead to be trusted as a gift of God that can, like all other aspects of the baptized person, be transformed and conformed to the service of God. And whilst I know Sam is writing in a different context, I think this is one of the key questions when we think about mental health, neurodiversity and faith. Are we willing to get let go of our fear of the unconscious? Are we willing to let go of the shame around these stories to accept that God may have created the fullness of our minds, bodies and experiences, that they may be gifts from God? The conversation about conversion therapy with regards to sexuality has reached the public sphere and general synod. That conversation in relation to autism is nowhere near so high profile. We don't hear the church speaking into that conversation, and often Christian charities seem to be amongst those supporting this work. In our churches, is it safe for people to be open about the reality of their stories, the fullness, the messiness? In my own experience, it's that neurodivergence is often conflated with mental health, and that there is pressure to conform, to try and be or appear to be more like other people. Brené Brown describes, I'm quoting this, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging and connection. Silence, secrecy and judgment fuel shame. And Judith Russell writes more about shame in her book, forbidden fruit and fig leaves. And I'm quoting Judith here, if shame is intimately linked with our sense of how others see us, then it is even more intimately linked with a fear of exposure. For many of us, our greatest fear is that if our real naked self is seen, then we might be rejected. And I think for me, one of the key issues in our churches is I think we perpetuate still a narrative of shame around stories connected with mental health and neurodivergence beyond that conversion to faith story. But for me, that's so sad because our Christian narrative is an amazing love story of God, a God who wants to be with us, of Jesus, God incarnate, living with us, being with us, seeing and accepting who we are in the fullness of all our lived experience, that we are seen, known and called by name, 
And that is true for every one of us with the whole breadth of who we are and what we bring. So I think for me, one of the key issues is why we don't let that bit of our wonderful story actually be lived out in our churches for all people. Thank you, Rachel. So you've both articulated very clearly and deeply and movingly um, something of the key issues in the context of faith and theology. Um, what would be your challenges to the church and what might be the starting points for the church to, to try and do better? Thank you. Um, I haven't been watching participant numbers, so I'll just repeat the content warning again to say that if you haven't heard me speak before, I'm talking about self-harm, uh, but won't be talking about methods. I think to start with what the church needs to do, we should look at what Jesus models for the church to learn from. There isn't much direct talk of self-harm in the Bible, but in Mark 5, we see a story of a man who experiences self-harm out of part of the outworking of deep psychological distress. There's a lot to say about this story. A lot of journaling has been spilled on it and I don't have time to do it justice. But I'd like you to notice one thing next time you hear or read this story. Jesus engages with a man whose behaviours induced by his distress scares the locals into banishing, banishing him beyond the town so that they don't need to see or hear or care for him. Jesus doesn't look away. He speaks to him directly and he heals him. And what's interesting is that the people who were scared of the man who was unwell are equally scared of the man who dared to speak to him. On some level, Jesus becomes tainted by association. And I think unconsciously, perhaps, people still believe there is something contagious about mental distress. The more visible, the more taboo our distress is the more they fear that they may become like us or other people may become like us if we share our stories. So there are two central changes that I think we need to start with in the church. Learning from the work that disabled, queer and feminist theologians have done and the changes that they've inspired, I think we can say with confidence that breaking a taboo is the first step to real change. The church needs to stop isolating people experiencing self-harm through silence and clumsy pastoral practice, which means we need education for people in all forms of ministry. And when I say ministry and minister, I don't mean vocational and ordained. I mean anyone who does the work of the church. We need good learning resources. As a quick experiment, I reviewed the pastoral care textbooks available on the Common Awards Hub, which is an ebook repository for theology students, including trainee ministers from several traditions. None of them have the term self-harm in the index. We cannot expect people to minister in a context they never have any education or training on. The information that does exist is limited. It tends to focus on the med medical model. It tends to focus on deficit language and defines its discussion to adolescent young women, making the assumption that there is no room in adulthood for people who self-harm, there is no room in masculinity, and no reference at all to other genders. This infantilizes and degrades people and perpetuates the exact shame cycle that Rachel has described, that we know amplifies the experience of negative mental health. It also, is one of the biggest predictors of worsening mental health. And shame is known to perpetuate the self-harm cycle in particular. So there is research to be done so that these materials can be created. And that research needs to center and amplify lived experience. God willing, if I get through another few terms of my MA, I'm hoping to have the opportunity to ask some questions that will allow people to share the full range of their lived experience. As well as asking them about church, I hope to have time to explore some theological ideas, to move away from expert, air quotes, expert ministers and academics using other people's lived experience to form their supposedly expert opinions. 
For the church to change, this is a further area where we need it to be not about us without us. I'd like to take a moment to mention a group of researchers made up of service users, survivors and academics in the ESRC Centre for Society and Mental Health at King's College London. It's a mouthful, I'm about to drop a link in the chat. They're jointly developing an online platform to help people without academic experience to create and access research. Their aim is that anyone who wants it will have access to high quality resources and sources to discuss the whole research process to empower people to produce their own research in the field of society and mental health, pursuing questions that are important to them and to their own experience. I'm putting the link in the chat and you can also search for the phrase democratizing research on Google. Breaking the silence means more than just talking. It means paying attention to what the narrative is and what we're amplifying making space to listen to the voices of people who have experienced, and even more crucially, are currently experiencing self-harm. The church still has a lot to learn about letting people rest in their long Good Fridays or dark nights of the soul, without trying to pull people to the dawn of resurrection before they're ready. And the other part of breaking the silence is better pastoral theology, training built on the research and experience we've gathered that centers expertise by experience. People deserve pastors who listen to them and care for them. And making that happen is a simple matter of listening and learning. Wow, thank you, Kate, for an astonishing set of challenges. Um, you'll probably want to catch up with the chat later on because there was a, a lot of um, strong response as well. Um, Rachel. What, where do you think the church can begin? What are the challenges for the church and what are the calls to the church or the starting points? I think my calls to the church are to be bold and to be brave, um, to read the stories of the Bible and notice the breadth of stories and characters, many of whom wouldn't comfortably fit in our churches today. I'm not sure many of us could marry, imagine Jeremiah or Ezekiel or John the Baptist walking into our churches and be given a warm welcome. I'm not even sure Jesus would if we're honest, I think we need to be really careful in our language and in noticing what is going on for us when we are alongside other people. So often we have a desire to care for and to help someone else. But when we have that, have we become a attached to a particular outcome of what the end result of that help should look like? For example, if we're going to visit a friend, say, who's struggling with depression, is our desire to make them happy? And if so, it's helpful to notice whether the aim of happiness is shared by us and the person we're visiting or just ourselves. Are we willing to spend time with someone just as they are today? And if we're with someone who's experienced in the world in a different way to us, are we willing to accept our own discomfort with that? Or is our primary aim to settle our own uncertainties and fears? And is our desire to control the situation to make it acceptable and to make the other person conform. I'm not saying this is easy, sometimes being with can be really uncomfortable. But I'm sure each of us have experienced those moments of authentic connection with others, where we feel seen, where we feel known, where we feel accepted as ourselves. And I suspect in contrast, we've also all experienced those times when we haven't been seen, I'm sure you're familiar perhaps with that head on one side and that soft voice, that moment when we know we have become the recipient of pastoral care, we have become the one to be helped. But sometimes we're no longer seen as ourselves in that moment and it no longer feels safe to be vulnerable. And we start to hide, to mask, to pretend we're okay, to fit the other story the person seems able to hear and perhaps try and make them go away. I think it's important, though, to remember that this is about community, too, and people may have conflicting needs. I think we're in danger of wanting there to be a panacea, and there isn't any easy way to make everything OK for everyone all the time. I'll give you a very local family example here. My daughter and I have quite different sensory needs. She needs strong sensory input, a really squeezy hug. 
And for me, that strong physical contact can quickly become really overwhelming for me. So we have to find ways as a family to negotiate that. It can't be perfect for both of us at the same time in the same hug. When I'm in hyper-focus, completely absorbed in something, I can be really passionate about that something and it can feel like the most important thing in the world, even at two or three in the morning. But I've had to learn that it isn't necessarily the thing that everyone else wants to hear about all the time. And that's okay too. There's sometimes something about finding ways of being with each other that respect who each of us are. But I think so I wonder if some of the first thing that churches can do really is getting to understand more about mental health and getting less scared of it. And this could be something just very practical like a mental health first aid course. I think it's taking time really to listen to each other's stories. And when we're inviting people to share stories in church, to be open to a breadth of stories and experiences and to have the courage to accept that God is with each of us regardless of our mental health, our neurodivergence, and to be willing to listen to stories of sacred encounters from within the breadth of humanity, to listen and learn and celebrate God with us. Thank you, Rachel. That was just, I can't think of a word, it's really encouraging to have so many challenges and calls, so many practical first steps, but also so many so many big challenges for the church um, to begin to move away from its othering of mental health and its, its lack of diversity, lived experience and robust theology in practical terms too. Thank you both for your courageous and inspiring and honest and brave um, sharing of your experience and ideas today. It's just been astonishing. I hope you will have a chance to catch up with the chat to see some of the responses. We're going to have some time now to reflect and respond together um, by spending some time in small groups. Um, this is a, a chance about 10 minutes in small groups, a chance to reflect on our own experience and to respond to what we've heard what's shocked or surprised us, what's encouraged us, um, what might we do differently, what action might we take. So a chance to share your own experience and respond to what you've heard, what shocked or surprised you, what's encouraged you, what might we do differently or what action might we take. I remind you it's important to look after your own mental health today and to practice self-care. So if you need to step away, please do step away. You can catch up with the recording from the end of today. We won't be recording the small groups and we won't be recording the discussion when we come back together. Um, but we will be sharing online the, the earlier talks from just now and a little bit at the end. So you won't be missing out if you need to step away. So Jonathan, are we ready to go into small groups? There'll be groups of about four people and we'll be there for around 10 minutes. I'm going to call on um, Kate and Rachel to um, give us a couple of last thoughts. What would you like us to take away with at the end of today? Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are in any form of ministry or feel you have any sort of influence and are looking for training, I'd encourage you to think about experts by experience when you look for it. So recovery colleges, if you have one, or mental health networks are very likely to offer something and can be very good. Some mental health first aid trainers have lived experience and some don't. Um, and if you are living with self-harm as part of your experience or your story, I just I think what I'd like you to leave with is to know that you're not alone and you're not doing something wrong. And good pastoral care is out there, but it may take time to advocate for yourself to find it. But your story is valuable. Your understanding of your experience and your theological understanding are valuable. And you don't need to feel shame for how you cope 
you remain a beloved child of God and a valuable member of your community. Wow, thank you, Kate. And Rachel, any last thoughts from you that we could take away? I think probably I want to pick up um, something that, from something that was said earlier. Um, just recognizing the experience and the discernment that we learn through the experiences that we have and to actually be willing to value those and um, to share them and learn from them and to recognize the strengths in them. And I guess the other piece is, I think what I said earlier, the remembering our Krishna story is that amazing love story that really each of us really is loved as we are and welcomed and accepted as we are. And I'm so sorry that the church doesn't often communicate that, but particularly in the stories today of mental health and neurodiversity, it's still true. It's it's so true. Um, yeah, I want, I want people to take that away, to know that you are called and known and loved as you are. Thank you, Rachel. Um, today's conversation has um, explored some, some really deep experience and opened ideas. Thank you so much to Kate and Rachel for your incredible, brave and wise and challenging um, contributions today. It's really a conversation that will ripple outwards. I'm sure has moved and challenged and encouraged people far more than you can know in this moment. Thanks also to Jonathan and Kath for hosting the Zoom and for um, holding the space for us today. Thanks to everyone for all that you've brought and shared today. Thanks to HeartEdge for offering a platform where disabled and neurodivergent people can have more honest conversations about disability, neurodiversity, theology, culture and practice. This series is one offering from Heart Edge as part of their online festival of theology, Humbler Church, Bigger God. Heart Edge are a growing international and ecumenical network and movement for change in the church through commerce, culture, congregation and compassion. You can read more about Heart Edge or sign up for their mailing, catch up with previous learning and register for future events via their website. Details of some of what's coming up are in the chat. Shut in, shut out, shut up is taking a break now, but we'll be back on Friday the 10th of June to begin three more conversations, exploring the experience of disability and neurodiversity as it intersects with sexuality, race and poverty. We have some brilliant speakers lined up, including Vala Nicholas, an activist, writer, postgrad researcher and trainee lay preacher. He sits on his church PCC and spends a lot of time asking hard questions about inequality and faith. He is disabled, autistic, queer and transgender and will be joining us for our conversation on sexuality on the 10th of June. Lamar Hardwick is an autistic black Baptist minister in Georgia, the USA, author of last year's award-winning book, Disability and Church. Alexis Padilla is a blind Latinx academic and scholar working at the intersection of neurodiversity, pan-disability and race. Her book, Disability, Intersectional Agency and Latinx Identity was published last year. They will both be joining us on the 17th of June to look at the intersection of disability, neurodiversity and race. There are a few other conversations and events in the pipeline. The annual conference will be back on Saturday, the 17th of October. Each of the speakers are on Twitter, so do follow us if you'd like to keep up with what's happening and join in the conversation. That wraps it up for this series. Thanks again to Kate, to Rachel and to all of you. Particular thanks today to Jonathan Evans, who will be moving on from Heart Edge at Easter. Jonathan has been a tremendous encouragement in these series and indeed in all our disability work together over the last seven years. He moves on with our enormous thanks and prayers for his future ministry. Thank you again, everyone. We hope to see you back here in June. God bless. <laughs>